welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I'm speaking with Nadia Gill. Nadia is a former attorney who has turned documentary filmmaker. She co-founded Encompass Films and makes documentary films with her husband. They've been doing that since 2011. She's the producer of Above the Alley, Beneath the Sky, and On a Wing and a Prayer. She is someone that is very passionate about filmmaking, uh, mostly for documentaries, but I think more in general. And we had a fantastic conversation um, about documentaries and filmmaking in the process, but really, um, I would say in a broader lens as well. Um, you know, I, I've, I've been trying to branch out on the podcast and, you know, not stick to just kind of researchers and scientists and things like that and really try and get um, other folks that have a really interesting perspective on things. And so, you know, Nadia has a really sharp mind and really good perspective. And so I, I wanted to get her on to talk about her ideas and how she uses documentary filmmaking. And we did just that. We had a really, really fantastic conversation, um, really about truth, um, persuasion, um, and, and many of these themes and, and where that lies in the medium of, you know, filmmaking and, and specifically with documentaries. We start by talking about her background and her shift from law to documentary filmmaking. She also gives some of her personal background. We talk about in the beginning of the conversation, the importance of telling the truth in documentaries. You know, what is truth? Why should documentary um, films talk about the truth or try to seek it. We talk about this tension of, you know, showing a perspective and, you know, describing objective truth about reality in documentaries. We have a nice part of the conversation where we, we have a little bit of a back and forth about um, whether there's a responsibility that lies with the filmmaker or, or does responsibility lie with the audience member to ascertain certain truth claims. We talk about persuasion versus propaganda. Um, we talk about, towards the back half of the conversation, you know, who gets to tell what stories? You know, talking about issues such as cultural appropriation, you know, if there's certain people in one group, can they only tell, you know, stories about folks in their group? Um, or can you tell about stories about other people in other groups? Uh, things of this nature. And we give plenty of examples from uh, other documentaries and, and some films and things like that. And so, you know, I have to say I was, you know, I had no idea really with any conversation I go into what I'm, what to expect, but I, I was really, really pleasantly surprised to, to see how much we were, um, kind of zooming in and zooming out of, we're talking about truth and persuasion and propaganda, um, and then more of the specifics. And so, you know, Nani was a good interlocutor for, for talking about these issues and, you know, she's the kind of person, her and her husband, that you would want um, to be making films honestly and, and ethically. And so she's she's doing fantastic work, both of them. And and um, it was a really, really big uh, pleasure to have this conversation. So now I bring you Nadia Gill. I'm here with Nadia Gill. Nadia, it's nice to see you. Hi, thanks for having me on, Javier. Yes, it's, it's, uh, it's quite the pleasure. And I am excited to talk to you mostly because, um, well, you're great, you're very nice, but you do good work. But I haven't, uh, I haven't had many, or haven't had any people that are in film or doing documentaries specifically. And so I know this is kind of your world now and what you're doing. So I'm, I'm super excited to have a really nice conversation about it. So why don't you just tell listeners uh, who you are, what you do? and uh, anything you're currently working on. Hi guys, my name is Nadia Gill. I am a documentary filmmaker. It's my second career. I, my first career was a lawyer and I switched into documentary film about 11 years ago when I met my husband who was already a filmmaker and I kind of looked at what he did and I said, that looks really interesting. I'd rather do that. And um, I really love the profession. I focus mostly on outdoor and environmental films. Uh, we sometimes do branded content working for companies like Patagonia or Black Diamond Equipment or Red Bull. And, uh, and I also make short form and feature length films on our own independently financed and 
it kind of absorbs the more mature part of my filmmaking brain, I would say. Uh, but it's all fun and I really love it. And I'd love to share with you anything that I can, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about in the profession. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's wonderful. Um, okay, so, so just, just briefly here. So what kind of law did you do and why did you leave it all behind? What, what was it about law that just didn't, uh, just didn't really interest you anymore? Or why was documentary filmmaking more interesting, maybe I should say? Oh, well, actually, it, it was pretty much a coincidence. So um, after law school, I went into real estate finance. I graduated law school in 2007. As you know, the market crashed in 2007. I did a lot of non-performing assets and kind of restructuring for you know people who had a lot of debt on their houses and couldn't make their payments. I held on for a couple of years, but um, the you know, the economy came for us all. And essentially I was laid off around bottom of 2009. And I was thinking, what should I do? Um, I thought it would take a number of years to kind of claw out of the hole of the real estate finance pit that I was in. And I thought, well, if I was going to put that much energy into resurrecting a career, what is there something else I would rather do? And that was around the time that I met my husband. And there were a lot of similarities between what I loved about the law and what I liked about documentary film, I got to be very inquisitive, ask people a lot of impertinent questions, kind of uh, have a frame or a point of view for the narrative and the way that you want to tell the story or the arguments that you want to make. Um, I loved that you could dive into a subject and immerse yourself in it, but it wasn't really your profession. There was something else that was your profession and you could kind of keep my mind engaged and continuously, um, updating with, you know, new information all the time. And so, but what I, what I liked about it more than the law was, uh, the visual nature, the travel nature, the way you choose to have intimate relationships with your subject that you build on, that you have a, a sense of, um, responsibility for there's some of that in the law but in so many ways as a lawyer you're you know you're more liability focused and i think when you're a documentary filmmaker you can be more ally focused in certain ways um i love the skepticism i love the search for truth and meaning that comes out through the process and and i just you know i started an endeavor and i found it really satisfied my soul it's really it's really nice so you don't you don't you hear people that have uh, kind of second careers, but, you know, I mean, going from a kind of careerist kind of profession like law or, you know, people do medicine and things like that and doing something more, um, you know, less uh, charted out in the way law is, right? And I think that with what you're doing now, it's great because, yeah, obviously you learn many things in law school and I think just, you know, people's personalities come into the mix of <clears throat> you need to have... Uh, an analytical kind of mind, you know, very critically focused, very uh, investigative and inquisitive, and how do you look in arguments? And so having that kind of um, approach to filmmaking, I could definitely see that, you know, there's some transferable skills there that could map on nicely. So, um, and just what about you personally, as much as you want to share, you know, your, your background and where you grew up and, you know, where you come from and all those things, how does, how do you find that um, impacting your uh, lens, if you will, your, your kind of grid that you're coming out of that impacts how you're doing filmmaking and, and, uh, and what you're doing now. Yeah. So I kind of mentioned that I would think it would be worth giving, uh, your listeners a little bit of background about my, um, you know, growing up and personal history, just because when you make a film, inevitably the lens through which you look is colored by your own personal experience. And we can talk about later more about how that intersects the search for truth as you see it and whether or not it's subjective, or if you're pursuing objectivity in some way, how you're limited by it. And so with that in mind, I thought I would just give a brief background. I am, um, I've, I'm born in suburban Los Angeles in 1980 to mixed ethnicity parents. My mom was, uh, is, is Mexican and my father is Egyptian. Um, they were a little bit, they were late in life to being parents. And so they were a little bit older for my generation. And I think that um, my cohort, my peers, parents, for example. And I think that really impacted the way that they raised me. Um, we, we were an upper middle class family and I went to a private Christian evangelical school where I, where I was raised in evangelicalism until I graduated high school. I then went to NYU where for the first time I pretty much learned about 
you know, things like evolution and seriousness and a number of, and met people of different cultures and who weren't my family members or who weren't the evangelical peers that I'd grown up with. And I kind of introduced me to a, a, another wide view of the world. And from there, I went to law school at Boston College. And after that, I traveled through South America for a year. And I think that's pretty good because I think that can give people an understanding of um, maybe the ways that I look at the world. Oh, this is very interesting. Um, we have <clears throat> a few points of uh, convergence there. Um, we, I also, if I've said this a few times here, but um, I was raised in a pretty fundamentalist Christian evangelical home. Uh, since I was very, very young, I went to um, a college and a seminary that was very, very reformed. Um, that was kind of my first training. And, you know, when I left the faith and I became an atheist and, you know, I had to relearn many other things. So I, I, I can be very sympathetic to, uh, at least in a general sense, that kind of journey. <laughs> um, I'm also from a, a mixed race and, well, I guess ethnicity, but whatever, uh, background. Um, you know, my dad's from Central America. My mom's white. And so, you know, I'm uh, definitely in, in understanding that component as well. Uh, although I don't hear Mexican Egyptian too often. That's quite the mix. So, you know, that's this very, very distinct culture. It's really, it's really cool. It is. But actually one thing that's common is, uh, half Middle Eastern, half Latin American. And there's quite a few famous examples from Selma Hayek to Shakira and a ah. number of other people. So there mm -hmm. must be something that the two cultures find a, a little <laughs> overlap in the Venn diagram prob probably. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And, uh, which, uh, where did you go in South America? Did you go to all the countries? I mean, or, or most of them or where, where did you go? Uh, I mostly spent time in Chile. Actually, I oh, spent uh -huh. uh, six months in Santiago, and then I spent six months living in a small desert town called San Pedro in the north in the Atacama Desert. Cool. Uh, and then I did a little backpacking around, but that, I predominantly stayed in Chile. That's cool. That's really, really nice. Um, okay, so then, you know, after, so okay, why, so you're, again, so that background and, and that perspective, how do you feel at this point in your journey in life, uh, how do you feel all of those, you know, myriad of experiences is impacting your um, ability to, to tell stories or to tell narrative in what you're doing now? How do you find those things uh, being, um, having some kind of imprint on how you tell stories or how you uh, place your perspective on, on things that you want to share? Well, your listeners probably don't know, but I've written a couple of articles for persuasion that really focus around who should tell what kind of story, which is a main dialogue that's happening in our field right now. And I have been a proponent of not, um, not prescribing who can tell a story too narrowly and, and definitely not basing it around, let's say one's identity or one's personal experience on the matter. And a lot of that I believe in, um, because I believe that, uh, there's a tension between truth and justice. And I want to just make sure that at the pursuit of justice and activism in our profession, we don't just, we don't, um, we don't, really foreclose what truth seeking is and limit who can speak. But at the same time, I think I recognize that the truth seeking aspect of our profession um, is kind of a veneer in certain ways. And um, we we characterize what documentary film is as purporting to tell you something about reality, although we're not very uh, proper about what that is. And we certainly don't have a framework for communicating to audiences effectively what it is we're trying to do. And I think one of the most important things is then to recognize, you know, if we're saddled with the point of view of the director, you know, where does that point of view come from? And so, for example, I, I even wrote the article, I think, because I grew up in a mixed ethnicity background and I feel, um, 
I feel one, like I'm a bridge between cultures sometimes, or I don't fully exist in one place. So I don't like lean into my identity. Instead, I can step back and kind of look at cultures a little bit more removed and ask like, well, what's the critical eye you're taking in that, in that view of the world or that cultural reality that you're living in? Um, Another thing that's important for me is because I am an apostate, I like to call us apostates, uh, I, you know, I have an aversion in some ways to people who have answer, who, who, who purport to have answers about, you know, what we don't know, which is something that um, religion has really, you know, showed me over the years that people were just not that comfortable and I don't know. So they fill it in with, um, here's the answer. And I think documentarians have a tendency to try and do the same thing. I don't know why our profession isn't more comfortable in the space of I don't know. And it's it's all over from the beginning of when you make a film and people who you try to bring on board ask you to, what happens at the end or what's your point of view? Or they really just try and keep, you know, um, guiding you into perspective rather than allowing you to kind of sit back and explore and have a mindset of trying to see outside of yourself, of decentralizing yourself as a filmmaker. And I, I find there's a little bit of a overlap between the way that I was raised in religion and a lot of what the documentary community um, feels as, you know, trying to fill in the blanks when there just are none um, and not having permission to just say, I don't know, or maybe I don't have an answer here or all the things in my research on this project, I came to a different conclusion than when I started. Um, and then for me, I just, I probably have a lot of the proselytization um, brain still. I spent so much of my life trying to tell people, you know, this is the way, this is what you should believe. This is the truth. And being told that proselytizing was a good thing. And now I've come over to this other craft of searching for truth and claiming bits of truth about the world. And I, maybe I still too have a propensity to just use a megaphone and say, Hey, listen to me. I know the answer. This is what the answer is. And I think I really struggle with that tension between in my heart, knowing that you have to live in the, I don't know space. And then maybe, you know, as out of habit and out of the way that I was formed as a person, believing sometimes that I should just power through that and tell people what my point of view is. Um, and so that's where I come from in my profession as an individual. And you can, you know, take it for what it's worth and whatever I have to say next. Yeah, it's a very interesting uh, uh, constellation of, of uh, intersecting parts there. So <clears throat> I think the first thing here is um, there's, a, <laughs> you're, you're saying how I, I am seeing the kind of connection points of, of being in a religious kind of environment and then, you know, kind of in, in the documentary filmmaking space you're in now. I wouldn't assume to uh, think those things are connected, but, you know, the way you shared it, it makes sense to me. <clears throat> what, um, what you're saying here that um, you, because of your... Um, you know, mixed ethnicity and your your background in that, that you can kind of, um, you know, kind of uh, the segregate or, you know, remove yourself from being in one camp or one kind of, you know, way of thinking and you know, bridging cultures or bridging stories or bridging people together through, 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 uh, through your art. And, and that's coming based off of your, just who you are. Right, just what what your makeup is, um, and 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 I hear that it resonates, but and then on the other hand, you're saying also that <laughs> you have still this uh, this uh, internal kind of uh, gear of saying, <laughs> well, I want to convince you, I want to proselytize about you know some some. Uh, truth aspect in, in whatever you're showing or, or that there's this perspective. And, and how do you find that these two things work together where on one hand, you're not aligning with a particular group or idea or necessarily based on your own um, uh, mixture of, of things and you, how you identify, at least you know, culturally and things like that. But then also saying, well, if I'm telling this story, there's a perspective I want to try and aim. And so that there's not this 
you know, there's no pure objectivity, right? But you know how that there is an angle, that there is a side, and so how do you, how do you kind of balance these two things of of having not really in one space, uh, uh, you're aligned with one, you know, culture or race or whatever in one aspect, but then on the other hand, you definitely want to give people an answer or give them a uh, a direction. If I'm understanding correctly, how do you kind of make those two things uh, square to, square together? Yeah, I mean, that's actually what I'm thinking about a lot these days, because I, there's something in my nature that really believes in the search for truth, in the scientific method, in the rational process, the Socratic method, these kind of um, schemes that we've developed for decentralizing yourself as the object of, you know, the worldview that you use. But at the same time, the practice of filmmaking necessarily requires that you filter and interpret the world and then digest it and put it back out in a in a film product, right? And I personally am struggling with that. And if I had a simple answer to what you asked, I guess I would say that mostly what I proselytize about is the fact that one should not be as married to their identity as maybe they think they need to be. But at the same time, I don't know if that's a temporary worldview. And I don't know if I need to really reflect on that and and just um, deconstruct it even further because ultimately I'm just falling prey to the same thing that we all do, which is assuming that your worldview is the one that's worth you know other people living and absorbing. And so I I mean I, we can talk a little bit about the film that I'm working on, but I'm struggling with that right now. I've started making a film on the conservative movement for climate change policy, and this is excuse me, it might not be that clear the conservative movement to combat climate change. So these are conservatives that um, understand climate change is real. It's man-made and want to conservatives. So just to clarify, so it's a, it's a mix and it, there are okay. some politicians in it. And then there are some grassroots individuals, some okay. people who work in policy, but generally people who are aiming to move the Republican engine towards climate change and say, Hey guys, we need to do something about this issue. We can't stay over in the corner while Democrats, you know, put together a cohesive plan because they understand it's real. And we're still like, you know, having an argument about that. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's a, it's an interesting project. I'm, I'm really interested in people who deviate from their groups and people who do so because, um, you know, they have a clarity of mind about something which, um, maybe needs still convincing in their group. And I think that's a hard place to be, but in response to your question about, you know, what kind of perspective do you take and, is how can you reconcile that with the fact that you know it's subjective and you aren't being as objective as you want? Um, that's really hard. I've decided this is a film that should be for a center right audience. And if I keep the audience in mind, I necessarily am not doing as much of the reflection, investigative work and object, you know, and objectivity and truth seeking as I would naturally be inclined to do. And I'm like, well, I just spent all this time telling people, no, you should pursue objectivity. You should decentralize yourself. And yet here I am in the middle of making a film that clearly has a perspective and clearly is aiming for, you know, talking to a certain group of people in a certain way. And I keep coming back to over and over, well, why are you doing this, Nadia? Why are you taking this approach if you keep preaching, um, you know, no, you should be really looking at this in a more, uh, in, a, in a fairer way, in a way that's not, in a, in a way that pursues actually trying to describe reality as it exists rather than just a narrow point of view. And I don't have an answer. It's a point of hypocrisy that I feel in myself right now. I am at least happy I'm thinking about it because I definitely feel the tension of those two natural impulses colliding yeah uh, well it's very nice of you to be so you know <laughs> transparent about your internal struggle um, and i hear that i hear that i, I do i do i think that um it, it is hard i think because objectivity is something that is um uh, you know well uh, revered and people really respect that and they want that. And I think in many situations, that is something we should shoot for. <clears throat> the, and yet, the philosopher uh, Martin Heidegger 
said that the objective and the subjective are subsumed within each other. You can't really divorce the two, even when you try. Um, and he looked more at the phenomenological aspects of humanity. Um, but there always is going to be a bias. There's always going to be some uh, perceptual difference of, you know, look, this is coming from you. So you could have, for example, in, in, your, in, in what you're saying that the current film you're doing is, well, 10 people could make the same film that you're making. You know? And, it, you know, it's something that is, um, I think, important to do to show, okay, you know, a, 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 a faction or, or a party or um, a, a group of people that have a worldview that's conservative don't typically think and speak publicly very favorably about climate change. A lot of denial, minimizing, et cetera. But not all of those folks that claim conservatism believe that. And so trying to tell that story could be very helpful. It could be very, and in that way it is objective, right? It's saying, look, maybe we don't just let one party or one group of people or one, you know, folks that have a certain worldview, dominate all of the ideas maybe we can have maybe it's a small group but maybe there's some conservatives out here that also care about the planet they also care about climate change and they also have ideas about how to uh, correct for that that's a fine idea but so back to my analogy right or my example if you have 10 people that have the same thesis if you will right they want to make the same kind of film essentially each one of them, barring any of the technical things aside, is going to have a different viewpoint. And that's the subjective component. So I don't always think um, that it's, I think the, the, the struggle is good, right? I think that's a good thing. Um, because it's, you're not allowing yourself in film or when telling a story to be uh, completely persuaded or assuaged to one side, so, right? So just the fact that it's a back and forth is probably a good thing. But I think both are going to happen. You're trying to do uh, an objective as best you can a story and doing it from your perspective, from your bias. We all have our biases. And I think recognizing that and acknowledging that and still trying to use it in a productive and adaptive way, I think is what most people would would want out of someone that's telling a story. Um, so I don't think you have to uplift ob objectivity only or dismiss objectivity. I think there's a, um, there's a healthy push-pull, healthy struggle of both of those always, especially in something like trying to tell a story like you're trying to tell. I don't know, I don't know if that makes sense, or what are your thoughts? It does make sense. And I just would like to clarify, I don't agree, I agree with you. And I don't think at all that objectivity is achievable. Um, and it is what I'm talking about is uh, the choice to attempt to decentralize yourself and see outside of your subjective experience as a practice, as a craft in the filmmaking process. Um, I think some filmmakers do that. And I think other filmmakers don't. Other filmmakers have an exact goal in mind as documentary filmmakers, particularly, and they want to execute that argument and prosecute that argument to the fullest extent in order for it to be a piece of persuasion for the people to see the world in their view. And I'm really talking about that tension. And I, in this film specifically, when I say I have a center right audience in mind, um, what I'm saying is I aim to use this as a tool of persuasion specifically, rather than a tool of investigation and curiosity and exploration. And I think those are the halves of me that, you know, I'm, I think, naturally more inclined to the investigation, exploration, curiosity aspect, although I find myself once again making a tool of persuasion and I'm like, I'm not ending up here on accident. So why am I choosing to lean into the tool of persuasion? Is it, um, is it part of our cultural institution as documentary filmmakers? Is it the way that I 
saw the world as a Christian for such a long time and I have this practice of even of evangelizing? Or is it simply that you see a need and you think, oh, I can fill that hole. And in this case, the need is there have been zero films made for a conservative market that help understand that climate change is a problem and we should deal with it. Occasionally you see, just to not be, to not exaggerate too much, you see tidbits of that message coming out in other films, but I haven't seen a piece that is meant to really change the messengers and use the language and values that conservatives have to um, talk about climate change. And therefore I see a hole in the market, if you will, or a film that hasn't been made or a way to talk about climate change, which seems novel or an original. Um, and that might be effective and bringing us together, decreasing polarization, getting legislation passed, putting one foot in front of the other on our route to, to you know, combating climate change. Um, but in the service of that, it's definitely a tool of persuasion. It is not. And I can feel when I'm making it, I can feel that I learn way more. Let's say the spectrum of the universe of knowledge that I absorb is, you know, a hundred times wider than the, what I am going to decide to put on um, the timeline. And you, there's just a distance between why, what did you learn in that universe of knowledge and what is transformed into a film and when we talk about how people get from one to the other, that's the whole ball game. That's the enchilada. What kind of person are you? Are you curious? Are you investigative? What's your character? Are you doing this with activism in mind? Are you activism in mind? Are you doing it, um, you know, as propaganda, uh, as a tool? Like, and I just, I think there's a lot of struggle that goes on in the field about what we're supposed to be doing and. I, it's, it's interesting. I just think audiences don't actually know all that. They just, they see the sliver of the universe and they are immersed in the experience and therefore it is the truth in some way. And maybe they step back and they're like, oh, I get it. It's not the whole truth. But I mean, a lot of these films, people walk away thinking that they have, they have now the answer that they need on any given subject. So I, I guess my question for that is about the persuasive element. So what? So you're trying to make something that's persuasive. Okay. Is that, that's not problematic. Why, why is there, I mean, it can be, but because it can be, doesn't mean it is. So, okay. You're trying to persuade people of a certain vantage point. Why is that problematic for you? I mean, I guess problematic is a strong word. I just, I guess I'm saying I have knowledge that a lot more goes on than what you select to be the most persuasive. And there's a difference between making a film that, um, you know, kind of really addresses the context and the fullness of the topic and one that's designed to lead people down a certain path, lead people to the water you want them to drink. But that, but again, if you have a perspective and you want to tell a particular, uh, or you want to capture a particular aspect of a story, you don't need to tell the whole story. There's other people that do that, or yeah. not one thing can do all of that. And if you're saying there's zero films on this perspective, okay, then you're focusing on that perspective. What's, what's the problem with that? I, I, I don't think that there's a problem. And I am a proponent, and I say in one of my articles, that the solution to this problem is to not limit who can speak and make multiple films on the same subject from different filmmakers because there is no person who can see every facet of a issue or even if they can see it there's no person who can give you a 90 minute film that possibly shows you every facet of it mm -hmm. so in that regard that is exactly your point and i agree I guess I'm just giving voice to the approaches that people can take and how I have sometimes like I voice that I prefer one approach, but then I find myself taking another approach. And what, why is, why does that the case? Because a lot of people who don't agree with me think that's the case because that's the only path that we actually have the completely subjective persuasiveness. And so, I mean, it kind of, it, it, resolves their point in some way that it says, oh, that's true. Even as I try and do this other thing, I keep finding myself just leaning into the version of the cathedral that I think I should be sharing with people. But I guess it sounds like there's two parts to it is what I hear. 
uh, and you tell me if I'm wrong on, in my read of this. It sounds like you're because other people use certain uh, stories, whether it's in film or writing or whatever, they will use it to uh, persuade their ideology or or their um, uh, worldview, and it will become propaganda of sorts. Mm-hmm. And and um and 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 no internal ethics or morals about that. If I can persuade at all costs and I can lie and use misinformation and I can twist things and I can give a perspective that I want so that way I persuade people to think this and I can do it effectively. Uh, visuals are extremely powerful. Um, why not? And so that's a, that's a, that's a danger. There's some, this uh, has some of the ethical dilemmas there. And it sounds like, so my read of what you're saying is you're afraid of that in general. And then you're afraid of your own, uh, uh, <laughs> your, <laughs> your past, uh, uh, upbringing and background, uh, speaking in a religious context of, you know, this kind of that shadow of, of God, that shadow of religion looms large. And it's, there's very, you know, animated and, uh, you could say in some ways aggressive, I have the answers and I want to convince you otherwise that, you know, I have the way and taking that um, style or temperament uh, for something like uh, telling uh, stories in film or, or, or documenting certain things in film. And then with this added layer of, you know, the, the unethical path of potential propaganda, it sounds like you are just very worried about those things. Am I right on that? Yeah, I mean, I think you've diagnosed it pretty well. I would say, speaking to number one, um, there is no ethical framework in our um, profession. And I believe some people are working on one right now, realizing that this is a... Um, should there be? Should there be one? Well, that's a good question. And let's come back to it. Let me just finish my thought really yeah, quickly. Yeah, yeah, okay. um, but I, that is why I go back to the, it's a practice or a craft or a character of the thinker. Documentary film is an incredibly intellectual pursuit at which point you, um, you, 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 you know, outcomes some, something about reality that you make a claim to truth about. And I just think if you don't have a practice of really arguing with yourself, criticizing yourself, criticizing others, then you're going to end up with a product which is more like propaganda, which is more like ideology. And I think we suffer from that to a good degree already in film. I think some of the films that I can give the best examples of right now are um, the film Sea Spiracy, which was on Netflix, which if you read the coverage of it, you find people of all sorts of actual academic professions who have been studying the nature of, um, you know, overfishing in our oceans coming out and saying oh this guy you know he says a lot of useful things he's not it's not that the poetic truth of what he's saying is wrong it's that the actual the actual analysis is like devoid of nuance and reality in such a way but he that guy i don't know him personally so i'm, I'm not going to speak to his character but this is the second film he's made which seems very ideological in nature he has an action he wants you to become a vegan and he's going to make the most persuasive tool he can in order to engage you in that way um it's just not my approach i don't think that that's going to help us as a world um get to the place where we know what's our next step that we should take uh so go ahead so okay so i'm just playing devil's advocate here what's yeah. wrong with him doing that I mean, it's just not, it's not, it's not that it's immoral or unethical. It's uh, that it's not my philosophy on how to get to a place, a progressive place in the world where we are going to be moving forward towards a better reality. I think you have to wrestle with the truth. And I know nobody likes that word truth. It's very slippery. It's a wiry word, 
um, well, let's say we just, we have to use the best knowledge we have that is mediated by groups of people which seem to have a less vested interest in what the outcome is and wrestle with that information in order to kind of navigate and find our way to a better future. That's my philosophy I'm giving you. That's what I say is the way, you know, back to the point. Now I'm proselytizing to you about what is the way. Right? No, I asked the question. I asked the question. <laughs> but okay. But again, you're, but you have your, what you just said, you have your framework, just like yeah. this person has their framework and this other person has their framework. Why is it, if there's different people having different perceptions and they're uh, showing that, why is that, why do you see that as maybe, um, you're saying it's not your style personally. That's I'm fair. saying, I don't think it's wrong. I think it's unwise. That's what I'm saying. It's a okay, matter of wisdom, yeah. not a matter of morals or so why, ethics. So why is it fine? Why is it unwise? I just think, I mean, I'll go back. I'm, I'm going to lean on somebody else's writings here than my own. Um, okay. I know that you recently had John Rauch on your podcast. He yeah, recently wrote a whole book on the state of people's ability to parse, you know, what is reality and not reality. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, I think we were struggling to know what is real anymore. We're struggling to know, you know, what is reliable information and you see it turn up in, in society in different ways. And I think part of the reason that we're there is because people have given up on this idea that out in the universe, there is something called reality and that I might have a hard time seeing it and you might have a hard time seeing it, but our job is to try and actually see it as much as possible, not to lean into our perspective of the universe. Right. And I, and it's pretty simple. I just think I'm, it's not what I view as the wise path forward. And so I guess I want to make a stand for it in some way. No, I, I totally respect it. But I, I, I guess the only thing I would say about that, and you, you can fight me on this if you want, <clears throat> but I think with what, with the elements about what Roush says, because I, I totally agree with uh, much of what he says. Um, he's mostly saying that with institutions, what you're doing is, would you consider it a type of art or no? Yes. And this is a question though, but a documentary is a specific type of art. And it's, I think our, our industry struggles with having one foot in journalism and one foot in art. And it is the problem that we have is the contract that we have with the audience itself and what the audience thinks it's getting from watching a documentary versus what the filmmaker thinks their ethics or responsibility is in making the documentary. And I think that's where the actual tension lies because ultimately the audience always thinks that you, you they, they believe there's a narrower version of, of, of the zone of truth that they're operating in than the filmmaker does. The filmmaker thinks that the zone of truth is like, you know, 10 feet, 10 feet wider than the audience member does. And I guess my argument is like, we need to, we need to close that distance in some way that either means we need to more vigorously broadcast. Hey guys, none of this is truth. Whereas this, this is totally a veneer of truth because we just, you know, we do, we happen to be using archive footage and interview and these other kind of techniques that look like journalism. But in fact, you should not take this as truth. You should take this as fiction, just the way you take the rest of art. Right. Um, because fiction tells you things about truth as well. Right. It's just, it's that the, the contract with the audience is different. Or we should close the difference by maybe understanding that we're never going to let our audience is never going to understand the full range of tricks and techniques that we operate with in making a film. And so maybe we should be more stringent about the guidelines that we have when making a film. And this is, I mean, I, I actually think very few filmmakers agree with me. I think almost everybody prefers the, oh, we're art because it gives you a greater license to, you know, share your view or speak about the world in a way with less responsibility to your audience. And I find that, um, I think that I, I, I believe that that contract with the audience is maybe um, more indicative of how we should behave as filmmakers. It's interesting. I, I think that uh, I'll go back to Heidegger again. Uh, you know, he wrote a really big uh, or, or not big, but he wrote a long essay on basically stating that, you know, the only truth in life 
um, comes from art um, <clears throat> because it's untouched. It's pure. It's, it comes from the unconscious, comes from the phenomenological aspects of someone. Um, Nietzsche believed the same thing. Um, and a few others believed very, very, very much in the power of art because anything else that we know as true necessarily, and that's a hard philosophical debate that people have, but they believe that art was the, the medium. That was the, that was the bridge that could get truth. Um, and so it's very interesting what, what you're saying. Um, I, I yeah, I actually just don't agree with that. I'm just going to go straight against no, okay, it. Okay, okay. I respect, I respect art for its reflection of certain truths, mostly poetic truths or ecstatic truths about the universe and the way we operate and the human condition. But I, I absolutely don't believe that the only place that truth comes from is art. I mean, everything you know about the universe very concretely comes from not art. It comes from Beautiful. mostly science and also philosophy, mathematics or whatnot. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you use yourself, you're happy to use your cell phone. You're happy to get on an airplane. You're happy to see, you know, the Hubble tele pictures from the Hubble telescope. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to talking about truth, suddenly it's subjective. And I just, I find this to be a, a big trick that we're playing on each other. That's a, a rhetorical trick in some way, rather than dealing with what, you know, which is, we don't know everything, but, and, and I, and I get the idea that even, you know, that science is imperfect. It's tainted by also bias and perspective, but that over time you, you know, you layer what you know, and over and over when these rules don't break, they tell you something that you can count on. And I guess I would like for the documentary film community to be more part of that community, which tries to take seriously, you know, aggregating a body of knowledge that we can in some way move towards, um, you know, improving the world by by mediating this reality which we all argue over that being said i respect i'm not trying to push every filmmaker in away from the artistic mm -hmm. um the artistic condition of documentary i just uh in some ways i, I think i want more uh what do you like more categories like you know it's not just documentary and fiction like we need more categories of, of to help describe these various ways. It's like, if you, if you look at literature, they've got like 50 categories to describe the body of work. And if you look at film, we've got like, you know, two or three experimental film documentary and narrative or fiction. We could, we could use more clarity. I think if we're gonna, if we're gonna just leave it in the realm of art. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I would, I, 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 I don't disagree with what you're saying. I, what I'm saying is, is that, of course, there's the objective, uh, there's subjective, um, but there's also a kind of a third layer to that, right? Which is the things that we experience that we can't explain, that we can't explain with the tools of objectivity or subjectivity. And, you know, this is, you know, the phenomenological uh, uh, thesis, right? Um, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Merleau Ponty always talked about this, right? So if I have here, uh, you know, let's say I have my cup, right? And my cup of coffee that I got in Iceland. <laughs> and, you know, if I set it here on the table, I can look at this and I can say that this is an object, right? You would not disagree with this. It's at I least would not disagree. It's at least an object. Yes. Okay. And if I set it here, how do I understand the object? There's me, the, the, the person, the, the subject, if you will, that's having a subjective experience about my understanding of what this object, the cup, is. But it's also within context. So I know that it's resting on a table, and there's a wall behind it, and it's in a room. That's a background, right? You, all things have background and context. You have the object and you have the subject. You can't ever get away from that, regardless. You're, you're just describing the problem of you can't be subject. You can't be objective. Not that there is no objective. No, I, I'm not saying you can be objective. I'm not, I'm not denying that. I'm, I'm including that in the equation. You can have objectivity. There is an objective reality. I'm not saying that. 
there's also a subjective reality. Yeah. Now, you can put whatever <clears throat> valuation on it or whatever moral topspin you want on any of that. That's fine. There's also an, a context, right? In this case, it's the table and the, the room. Okay. Now, there's also the experience of that, which I can't put in the objective bucket, and I can't put in the subjective bucket. It's the total consummation of all of those things together, which is there's, it, there's something of what it means to be, or there's some experience of what it means for me to sit in the room and to know that I'm a subjective being uh, with metacognition and all that, and that there are objects, right? And that I'm in a context and that there's a larger and larger and larger context. That's all an experience. And every time I come into the same room, it's always a little different. You can do this all the way down to quantum mechanics. And there's a different experience of that. And I never know what the experience is of the objective and subjective realities that we understand within a context is going to be minute to minute to minute. And so one way in which we understand what is true is the, the complete or the composite of those things. And in many ways, when you do art, you don't know what's going to come out. If someone writes a piece of music, they don't know what's going to, they don't have the, the melodies come into their head or the rhythms come into their head. When you have a, a, a blank easel and you're going to paint or so you're going to draw, you have no idea what's going to come out. You let things become uncovered and you say, well, I had an idea objectively. I wanted to draw a person, but you have no idea how it's going to come out. And there's the subjective experience of what that feels like when you're doing it. Okay, that's fine. And you know, you can subjectively say, I wanted to do this and this and this, but the total aspect of that is there's an experience and that thing called experience is the phenomenology of it. And so for many thinkers, art was the purest way of getting at that. And that was true. That was purely true more than any other aspect of objectivity or subjectivity or anything else. Not to say that one is better than the other or that the others don't exist, but that there is a more complete or holistic idea of it. That's, that's one version of the world. You don't have to agree with it, but it's a, it is a version. So. Yeah. And I, and I, I understand, I guess in true in that context is the integration of all of the three things. Right. Yes. Um, but that still puts you at the center of that. And I think the best things that have come, I shouldn't say the best things. I think that's really a relative term, but a lot of the most productive things that we've learned that, that, you know, make up the body of knowledge by which we have um, progressed in the world to greater human rights, to more equality, to higher quality of life, to having tools to make, you know, long, life longer, longevity. And a lot of that stuff is not grounded in that integrated place. It's actually grounded in an external validation of that integrated place. And over and over, we push the the knowledge or the truth outside of ourselves so that other people can externally validate it and over after a number of people regardless of their subjective experience regardless of their culture regardless of you know their you, you, their gender they come to this conclusion it's the same conclusion that you came to and that's the beauty of that kind of knowledge i respect both kinds of knowledge but i do think that there is a lot of proof in the utility value of the knowledge, which is not integrated, but externally validated and then built layer upon layer upon layer in life in which we all come to the conclusion that we have a shared reality. And I don't necessarily think that um, documentary should stop being art. I just think that we are losing the plot a little bit about how what we do as opposed to what fiction makers do is purport to tell you something about reality. And if that is the case, if that is the thing we purport to do, then we might want to take a little more seriously, the external validation aspect of reporting on that truth in some way. That's it. Yes. I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree with you. I agree with everything you just said. I'm just saying it's not only that. So here's another example. If you ask, 
10 people what happened on 9-11, you're going to get 10 different perspectives. We know the objective facts of what happened. And I, you, I don't dispute that. I don't think you dispute that. But that's not the entire story. And that's okay. Take it, take it more, more specific, right? Maybe not 9-11. It's too, too big of an example. Um, <clears throat> if I'm walking down the street in a city and I see somebody uh, bump somebody and they fall over, well, if I'm sitting behind the person, I'm going to have one vantage point and one perspective. If I'm at the top of a building and I look down and I see the same incident happen at the same time, that's another perspective. If I'm from the other side of the street on the other end and I see them in the front, that's another perspective. And all of those perspectives make up the objective reality. The fact is, is that something happened as opposed to not happening. Totally fair. But there are many other different versions of yeah. that same truth. And that's and fine. Go, that's a shared reality. And that's, I'm not saying that that's the, one's the shared, more the, right than the other. That's not the shared reality. The shared reality is after everybody reports on their perspective and a number of people get together and then they look at it and they kind of argue over it. And they're like, oh, actually, okay, I see your point of view a little bit. No, I see your point. Okay, we can take this little piece from you, this little piece. And then this is our best version of what we think the truth is. And that, that second part is very important, not just I share with you my perspective, but after you share with me your perspective and the third person shares their perspective, that somehow we discuss it for a little bit. Yeah. And that, that art of like kind of looking at it from outside of yourself and going around the circle over and over gives us some version of a shared reality. And I would actually say the reason it's important, and this is really goes back to why I kind of care about this right now and struggle with the internal tension of proselytization versus pursued objectivity is because he who controls the narrative controls the power. And that is times, everybody. Yes. The point of the proselytization is to service your narrative or to serve your narrative in the world so that your position can be preeminent. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see happen when somebody starts shouting, no, my perspective is right. No, my perspective is right. No, my perspective is right. I want everybody to have a chance to air their perspective. And if we are really going to do this, like I just am like, well, maybe we should be clearer about the fact that this is not truth. This is perspective, or this is not reality. This is perspective, but we need everybody to speak and we need them to try and see outside of themselves so that we can have the discussion to build the shared reality. And the tension exists because I acknowledge that the pursuit of objectivity is an impossible task, but I don't want to, but I value it because I value building a shared reality and I value contributing to that shared reality. I don't want to be, I don't want my ner my narrative to simply be in service of power. A hundred percent. And I, I don't disagree with anything you said. I just think all of them are in tandem and yes, you're right. You know, people have different perspectives and then we can get to a more clear representation or a clearer picture of, of what happened. But there are always going to be things that are uh, unexamined or missed, and that's okay. It, it's not 100%. Um, and, and sometimes not. That doesn't mean, I don't think everything is like that, but I think a lot of things are like that. So, so I'll go back to the thing that you had said that was interesting to me. <clears throat> We've been talking about <laughs> objective reality and truth and art and all that stuff, which is, which is so, so, so much fun to discuss. I guess the, the one thing that you said, which I don't have an answer to, and I'll be curious for your thoughts on this. Um, <sighs> is I have this interesting, um, I guess it's a value, of responsibility. And if someone makes a film or they make a documentary, um, I, I'm not trying to make it a false dichotomy, but that's how it's going to come out. You know, is it the responsibility of the person making it or is it the responsibility of the person viewing it to take away what they want? And of course, if you're having different people looking at this or you're having it, they're going to come away with something because they have a mind. They have an individual mind and they're going to look at it and see one mm -hmm. thing. But if the idea is, well, I want to be persuasive about a particular viewpoint or I want to be persuasive about the reality or facts of things, is that, does that behoove the person making 
the the narrative or 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 you know to 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 do that as as correctly as possible or is it well it's the responsibility of the person viewing it to critique it and to maybe not take everything at face value um to whatever 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 how do we understand that kind of um tension there between the person making the the art or 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 trying to find the truth um and then the person receiving it um and how they're able to be responsible with how they they take that message and then how they you know use it or or abuse it or whatever how how do you think about that kind of tension well without being paternalistic um i think that the maker of the content probably has greater power and therefore you know i grew up again going back to religion always 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 again um to whom much is given much is expected right like the responsibility lies in the power and that's that's actually i think pretty progressive also in this world and uh and so i just i guess it's i think of it as my responsibility and i that's pretty much all i can say is i would choose to i can only control myself i have the sure. the power to communicate something this powerful tool that ends up on netflix or ends up on hbo ends up in a place that it's rapidly consumed i spend you know a year and a half two years making a project and it's consumed in 90 minutes and I, the, the, the job is yours, in my opinion, as a filmmaker, the job is yours. And I don't think it, let, it lets the audience member off the hook. I just, if I were to place the response, if you're asking, where does the responsibility lie? It lies with both people, but mm -hmm. I'm talking about my profession and my filmmaking responsibility. And I'm going to assume a huge chunk of the responsibility. Yeah. So my question, yeah, my question was, so there's no responsibility for the viewer or what they do with that information, but okay. You're not saying that. Okay. I mean, there's more members of the ecosystem. I love when you talked about critique. I talk, I, I haven't talked enough about critique, but I actually think, um, I, it, when we, there's a lot of dialogue going on around in our industry right now about, um, whether perspectives are legitimate or not based off of your lived experience and whatnot. Um, and I and I think that that is where the art of critique comes in. And luckily, you know, film critique is a robust tradition. And I I just I really think it's a critical part of the ecosystem because it guides the skeptical interpretation of your view. Um, but I don't think that many audience members um, watch films that way, I guess. Or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm mm -hmm. wrong about that. Maybe audience member. Maybe I'm again, being paternalistic or uh not clear but i would say yes yeah, some responsibility lies with the audience members i just don't look at it as uh letting me off the fact that some people would like to displace that responsibility onto the audience members i don't want to displace it mm -hmm. yes they have responsibility but it doesn't give me it doesn't justify displacement of my responsibility yes i i, I again i agree with you i guess my struggle with this um i'll take something outside of um documentary films mm -hmm. for a minute and it's different i know it's different different set of rules different set of agenda but it's just an example um maybe it's a bad one but it's just an example many people will uh pick on um or or be very 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 cynical and, and uh, critical of mainstream media and how they report the news and how they talk about it and all these things. And they're all, it's, you know, uh, big corporations just trying to make money. It's all about clicks and views and, you know, they don't care and they lie and, you know, okay. But at a certain point, it, for me, it becomes, you're just blaming. And that's not to say that those criticisms aren't wrong about, or, or, or they don't have some truth in them, I guess you could say, but, I guess my thing would be, well, you have a responsibility to watch it or not you believe it or not. Like at a certain point, why do you keep watching something you don't like, or you keep, you know, just dogpiling on, just don't watch it. Don't entertain it. Don't give it viewership. You know, that's your responsibility. No one's got a gun to your head, forcing you to watch Fox news or MSNBC or CNN or any of these things, or to read the wall street journal or to read the New York times or read Washington post. You do that. That's your choice, right? You know, but you have some responsibility in how 
you do or do not do things. If you just want to sit there and just, you know, shit on it all day and just say how it's horrible and oh, it's so biased and whatever. And you go in your echo chamber. I mean, fine, you can do that, but don't you as the viewer have the responsibility or the reader or whatever to read it or not to watch it or not, you know, and, and even if you do, right, it's your job to believe it or not. You don't have to believe everything that's there. You have to know that there's a bias and that's fine. You can understand that when you view, view content and know, okay, this is coming from a perspective, but it doesn't mean all of it's wrong. It's just a certain lens that's put through. So uh, that, maybe that's a bad example, but you know, how, isn't that the same thing with film or, or with documentaries? It's like, sure, there's responsibility for the filmmaker, but there's also responsibility for the, the viewer as well, right? You, look, if I'm going to watch, uh, Blackfish, right? Mm. Um, documentary about uh, an example. Uh, till orcas. Till, till yeah, the the the, the orcas. Um, okay, I'm gonna come away and I can say, is this everything? Is this the complete story? Is this everything about this? What happened? Of course not. That's my responsibility of how much I entertain that or how much I, I go around spewing that. If, you know, I'll take some more, some more uh, 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 extreme examples. You know, because you I just, watch- Hold on, hold on, just really quickly. Are you, are you merely asking me to affirm your position that- <laughs> No, I'm asking. Audience members should have responsibility because I affirm it, but I still, I, I just think it kind of, it, 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 it doesn't get us as far as we want in life, right? Like the, the, there's, there's like a, there's the aspiration that audience members might take a more critical eye or critical analysis to, you know, what they watch, but I just, and, and then do they have responsibility? Absolutely. But what are the practical effects at the end of the day? I think a really great example that, um, recently I just was listening to it the other day is, um, the, I guess journalist Barry Weiss and uh, I, I want to say I guess public thinker Kamel Foster did a reevaluation of yeah. the Amy Cooper Christian Cooper story, mm-hmm. and I, I saw a short film about Christian Cooper, mm-hmm. and it was a good short film. It was you know produced well and it shared his point of view, and uh, but it it was not as rigorous in any way. It did not have any of the journalistic corners of this podcast. And the point of the podcast was that there was in, in ter- there was greater context. There were all these things that never came out in the media. And that if you ask yourself, why didn't they come out in the media? Why didn't the journalists, why didn't the journalists dig enough or write a story which may have paint, which might have painted greater context for this? Um, and the answer was. It's in service of power because this is the whole thing of like, if you want to ask, should the audience member be responsible? Yes. But then you will fall prey to the narrative that the filmmaker wants you to believe. And do you want society to operate that way? Do you want it us to be represented by the laziest of thinkers instead of the more rigorous of thinkers? Um, and I, and I mean that on both sides, the filmmaker and the audience goer mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you know, it's a limited sphere of people that maybe really bring a critical lens to any uh, any given scenario. I, I, I'm sorry, I paused because I actually felt quite bad saying that because I don't know how limited it is. I wouldn't say it's like so narrow. I don't want to discredit a num- you know, all, all these right. healthy thinkers out there in the world. But nonetheless, I think we could just be giving up the responsibility that says, okay, maybe if we don't if we don't work harder to impose standards on the filmmaker, we will ultimately fall prey to the most powerful narratives, which may not be true. I don't disagree with any of that, but I think that you're putting more, this is probably just a, 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 a weighted issue. You're putting, you're, or you're claiming you're putting more of the responsibility on the person, yeah. you know, producing it. And yeah. I would say, I don't think it's 50, 50, but I don't know if it's more, or less than for, for the filmmaker okay. because I, my example was going to be, did I watch the four hours uh, documentary on Michael Jackson and everything that happened? It was on HBO or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
okay. I didn't come away thinking one way or the other. I was like, oh. Yeah, but the vast majority of people did. And the same with the recent Woody Allen doc. And I won't sure. speak to the veracity of either of those things, but I can say the cumulative effect and the power of those documentaries on the average citizen and the narrative, which now is taken foot, uh, taken a foot because of those films is a specific way. It is a specific way uh, yes. that those directors wanted you to see it. Yes. And that narrative is now clearly, especially more recently in the, in the case of Alan, I would say, I would say, you know, if there were any holdouts left about whether or not, um, you know, this act was something he did, I think that this, you know, film put the nail in the coffin. And I don't know if it's any truer or less true after watching the documentary. All I know is that their narrative was powerful and they sold it to sure, the audience. Sure, and sure. I don't know the scruples. I mean, this these filmmakers, some people think they're extremely scrupulous. Some people think they're extremely unscrupulous. I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer to the Woody Allen case, but what I know is that the narrative, they sold it. They sold yes, it to the world. Uh, yes, they did. But again, I, yes, it's very convincing. They have the backing of the, 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 uh, the studio or whoever's putting it out. They have, yes, and there's, a, there's, you know, with more production and more money, they can do many other things. Sure. And I hear that. And I, and I hear that. But it still depends on the person that's viewing it to make up their own mind. I mean, that's, yeah. that's a reality. I mean, I understand. And yeah, but so no, I, no, no, but it's equally a reality that they don't make up their own mind, that they digest but what how, they've but how would that be? But how would that be the filmmaker's fault? They can't make up the mind of somebody no, else? No, is it their fault? I'm just, I'm advocating for a, a part of the craft which considers these effects. That's all. Of course, you should absolutely consider it. Of course. But look, if, if Ronan Farrow, right? That, that's, that's the guy who did it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, he didn't make the film. He's the, he's the journalist. The filmmakers are... Um, oh, okay. He was connected with it, right? Kirby Dick and Amy Ziering, I think. Yeah. Okay, so those, th th those three, they, we know they, they have a narrative they're trying to sell. Before I even... I haven't seen it, so... But, but I, I know what they're trying to say. They're not trying to, I, I don't look at Ronan Farrow and I'm like, wow, he's just going to give an objective account of what happened. He has, whether he says it or not, whether he says it or not, there is a bias and that doesn't bother me. That's fine. I don't mind that. The same thing with Michael Jackson's documentary. There was a serious bias. We want to say, this is how it went. And here's all these things. Okay, that's fine. But it's still up to me to say, this is one perspective. Now, I think it would be. Uh, sorry, I just like <laughs> I've interrupted you twice. Now. It's okay. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> my problem with this is why would you not, given that Ronan Farrow is a proper journalist, he's not an op-ed writer. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Why wouldn't you expect more of him than that? He's just telling you his version of the truth or whatever. And if that can be applied to. Why do you expect that of journalists? Why do you expect that journalists will dig harder for the facts and will be try what they will try to be more objective than you do from the average person? What is it intrinsic to what journalists are doing that you then place that responsibility on them? For me, to me, everybody has a bias. Everybody has their point of view. And that's totally fine with me. But you I, make a distinction between op-ed and journalism, correct? And reporting. But Why he, do you make that distinction? But, what is the expectation on the sure. person who is writing the op-ed versus the journal uh, versus the report? I think my, 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 my shorthand for that would be that if you're doing journalism, you have a sort of ethic of sorts of trying your hardest to aspirationally get at a balanced view of both sides. That's all I'm saying. That's why I want to bring that into the field a little bit more. Yes, but that doesn't that mean that there isn't a bias they have, even with that aspirational goal, that there isn't a perception, there isn't a perspective. And so I'm including that. That doesn't invalidate it, right? And that is what would be different from an op-ed, because an op-ed is, look, I'm very much this ideology or this framework or this whatever. Great, then I know it as well. But even with journalism, right, I think, and you're trying to get at what happened or what the facts were or whatever, that's fine, but there's certain things that you're going to ask based on your 
perspective that someone else would not ask. And that's not a nefarious thing. That's just a fact. It doesn't water down the journalistic integrity. It doesn't water down the doesn't aspirational water down goals. The journalistic integrity. You can't ever avoid that. It's impossible. No one else and no one on the you planet can, can do that. You can avoid it less. You could avoid it less. Yes. You, you can, can try. You, yes. <laughs> you, you aspirationally try to not, uh, not do that. And that's so true. In the end, you have just reiterated two times my whole position that I'm just saying, just like, like it's a part I want to, it's like an ethical part of the craft. That's it. And I don't even want it. It's, I, there is no expectation that documentary is journalism. I'm not trying sure. to equate it. I'm just trying to lean on the expectations of the person who reads a piece of journalism and the person who watches a documentary film and say that maybe we should acknowledge a little more that the people who are reading this have an expectation of the boundaries of truth that we are giving them. And there has been a number of hullabaloo's. I mean, just um, the last couple of weeks is the fiasco with, I shouldn't call it a fiasco, but the controversy with uh, Roadrunner, Morgan Neville's new film on Anthony Bourdain. And I would call what uh, what Neville did and what he did to be clear is he contracted an AI company to artificially render Tony Bourdain's voice in which he used that voice to simply read things that Tony Bourdain actually wrote. I will consider this a minor infraction, but audience members upon hearing that they didn't know it wasn't Anthony Bourdain's voice expressed like a great loss of truth, a great loss of reality. And what they were really saying is a great loss of trust in the filmmaker at the end of the day, that he's not pulling one over, that he's not. And I, and I just, it's not that those audience members are right or wrong. It's that there's some acknowledgement that this is the state between the documentary filmmaker and the audience member. And at some point you have to let them in on the secret if you want to gain their trust and you, and if and not gain their trust, keep their trust. And I just, I just recognize some of those principles go into making a film and that some people are really pushing the boundaries today um, of what that is. It could be anything from where the money comes from, you know, who has the creative control. Sure. There's all these unseen, yes. um, th these unseen pieces of the context. Yeah. And I, I just want to be more, I want to be more scrupulous about it. Uh, again, I agree with you. I, I, I think the, about the Bourdain piece, I, I mean, I don't feel strongly one way or the other about it. Um, I mean, that was their creative liberties. I mean, what's wrong with that? No, I mean, it's, they're not going some to jail. Are, some they're people, not going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some people are going to hate it. Some people are going to love it. I mean, what's the problem? That's true of anything. No, I mean, okay, I feel like we've already, just in case you want to know, I feel like we've definitely already d drilled down on this, okay? Um, <laughs> if you don't want film to, see, to documentary film, if you purport for it to be about reality and you take consideration into the fact that people think you're talking about the truth and then you serve them up a narrative, you are wrestling for control of the system. You are wrestling for control of the power. And that if you make mistakes in the way that you view reality, will we all be living in a universe that is further away from what is true versus closer? And I think we see that all the time. We see that people can move further away from the truth, not closer to it when they dig into a narrative. And I, I, I just, documentary is in service of that narrative the vast majority of times and, and, and any narrative, but it's, it's not a piece of, it's not a strong piece of journalism. Instead, it's a it's a craft of narrative, right? But yes, but with the Bourdain piece, if it's look, if those are his words and he yes, verbatim, and it's one small two minute or thirty seconds or whatever, I don't think that's pulling one over on the audience. I don't think that's being. Uh, I mean, maybe it's slightly misleading, but I mean, it's if it's for a creative effect well that's the boundaries the, the loose boundaries of art I, look if there's nothing about the integrity of the reality of the facts about his life or about many things that he did or didn't do or whatever and they want it to just at the end have like a 30 second as an in memoriam blah 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 or whatever it is okay it's artistic creativity 
Yeah, I actually, in this case, I have no problem. I said I felt it was a minor infraction compared to what the vast majority of filmmakers- But people are really upset about it? The people are very upset. People, especially people Why? close to him. They feel like it was a misrepresentation okay. of him, of who he was. But, but, but the clear thing is this. It's, I don't, it's not that I'm going to say they're right or Morgan Neville was right, that it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. My point is that it destroys the ecosystem of documentary film and the fact that people have a relationship of trust with the filmmaker that they don't even realize exists when they're watching the film. And going back to your question of what, what was the responsibility of the filmmaker versus the audience goer, and I'm like, you can ask all day what the responsibility of the audience goer is, but they will tell you that they implicitly believe the filmmaker every time we talk about you we can pull up example 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 after ex mm -hmm. example after example and we will see that the average viewer implicitly trusts the filmmaker therefore i place more responsibility on the filmmaker yes hmm I still think we're just, uh, I don't disagree with you. I think it's just more of a percentage of where we put it and stuff. I think you put it more on the filmmaker, yeah. probably put it a little bit more on the, on the kind of a, a more balanced, you know, 60, 40, 70, 30 kind of thing, uh, in my mind of viewer and filmmaker, but it's a really good, uh, I think debate because, you know, it's important to, I think, think about those things when you're watching, you know, um, anything. So I, I do think that that's really important. So I, I don't think we're going to, you know, necessarily, we, we can argue about the, the role of, uh, of how much is weighted or whatever, but I think we're, we're both in agreement. So it's, it's, a uh, it's fun though. It's a fun debate. Okay. So I have a, another question here, um, which should be interesting. I think we have a example of this, but with, um, with who gets to tell what stories, right? So let me just, uh, it's be interesting considering both of our backgrounds. So, okay, I'm, I'm you know, half Latin, right? Um, so I can, at, at the very least, maybe some people would say, well, yeah, of course you can talk about Latin culture and those stories and everything. But if I wanted to talk about um, Indian culture or Chinese culture or, you know, black culture or whatever, another culture that's not my own. Some people may say, mm, yeah, you don't get to do that. Only people of their own culture can get to do that. Um, so you could, you could talk all day about Egyptian culture. Uh, you could talk about Mexican culture, but you can't talk about uh, Finland <laughs> or, you know, Indonesia or whatever. And what do you think about people that kind of give these, um, I guess you could say rules, norms, if you will, about who can tell what stories or, or not? Well, I guess I'll first say I understand where they're coming from. Why? I guess I think a lot of this frustration in our society about um, cultural appropriation or um, interpretation of the lived experience or whatever way you want to phrase it actually just comes from feeling like people are playing catch up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a, there's always a dominant group of people that changes depending on the region or the country that you live in or the culture that you live in. But if you're not in the dominant group, you're not usually controlling the dominant narrative and it takes a long time to, break down the dominant narrative so that you can see the other perspectives to even have that discussion we were talking about where then you can, you know, argue over the perspectives and mediate what is the closest thing to reality that we can find. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of people today are very defensive about who can tell what story because fundamentally they're trying to just create space for these mm -hmm. alternative viewpoints to come up. Um, I think there's some confusion though with the idea that they're creating space versus that those perspectives are reality. And I think in our culture right now, a lot of people are assuming that the minority perspective is somehow truer than the dominant perspective, rather than understanding that we probably don't know yet which perspective is 
I, I won't even say closer to accurate, what the truth is until we hash out, we, until we get these minor, minority perspectives well established, and then we can kind of have the mediation discussion where maybe we can find, get closer to reality. And so I understand the instinct. And I just, again, I don't think it's productive in the search for truth to limit who can speak, period. I think that more than one film should be made on the same subject by different types of filmmakers so that you bring different perspectives to the same, you know, same circumstance or same piece of material, because I think that's the only way that we are going to figure out what the closest thing to reality is, is to have all the parties kind of contribute to it. And so you can see from the outside, what does that look like? What does it look like from the inside? What does it look like from adjacent? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I, I think it's unwise. I'll go back to that. And I don't know why I think I know what wisdom is, but clearly I have made a stake in this from my writings. And I just think that um, I get the instinct and I support the vision to see more alternative voices give their perspective. Uh, another reason why I'm, I don't like the guideline that's being suggested is because it doesn't work, I think, exactly as the um, proponents of limiting who can tell a story to that who has the lived experience doesn't it doesn't work like they think it does precisely um, for example i feel would feel badly like if if we can just speak frankly and say like okay let's just say white men told the stories that were out there for the last you know 100 years since film has been invented um, and now we need non-white stories like, I want to speak uh, as a female of color. I want to speak. I want the privilege to speak about whatever I want. These other guys did it for a hundred years. And now you're going to tell me I can only speak about being Mexican, being Egyptian, being a woman, being a lawyer, being evangelical. Like I like, we want to participate in that process of speaking as an exercise of searching for truth as much as anyone else. And so I respect that they want to create room for the insider to share that particular perspective or narrative of what it was like to live through something and to know something so in, in, the, in the Heidegger world, so integrated that let me put it forward. I have that integrated truth, right? But at the same time, I just think that you're excluding a bunch of people who didn't have the opportunity to speak before on that subject inadvertently. And you might learn something from those people. We might learn something from anybody out there and i don't like the idea that we can we can predict who we would learn from on the basis of what they look like what gender they are what positionality they have to the subject on the other hand i think what we don't talk about enough <laughs> is how hard it is to actually go through the process of learning and something you don't know about. And I find this even with making this film about the conservative movement and climate change for all intents and purposes. I don't think anyone in my industry probably thinks I shouldn't make this film just because I'm conservative. I just, that's just not really what they're talking about when they say you should be an insider, but you can apply the same principles. And I have a lot of catching up to do. I have a lot of catching up because I'm not, I don't have institutional knowledge of what has gone down in that space for years. And that process of truly absorbing yourself in the necessary, um, environment to have both you know to have a critical perspective is really difficult so i respect the insistence that not anybody should make a film but i don't think the answer is to prescribe who that person is hmm. yes <laughs> let, me, let me push it a little further um If the goal, I guess it depends on what the goal is, right? If the goal is to tell stories, why does it matter necessarily who's telling it? Put another way, I think you said in the beginning, <clears throat> you can write about, or excuse me, you can make films about Mexican women, let's say. Um, what's wrong if a white guy does that? It's a perspective. 
I think it's different if it's scripted films, you know, if it's, you know, it's a story, you know, that's maybe a little different because it's like, not to some people, but in my mind, it's like, okay, well, you know, it's, it's a story. And if you're trying to get a story, it's a, you know, just people are good storytellers or hopefully they are. But then also you're right. It does narrow the view of, well, because you're a Mexican woman or Egyptian woman or whatever, that you can only tell these stories or you should be telling these stories, right? Because we need your perspective. But then that kind of says, Sort of, I don't think directly, maybe implicitly that, well, you, you know, you, the, whatever group you're in, you're just a monolith, right? Well, well you're, you know, an Egyptian woman, so you're just going to, your, your experience of that is going to be everyone's experience of that. See, we have the Egyptian filmmaker telling a story about Egyptian women, boom, ta-da, and there it is. And you could have many people that live in Egypt or, or, or you know, immigrants or first generation or whatever here. They're like, uh, no, I don't. That's not how I see it. That wasn't my experience or et cetera. And so and I think it's a little bit different with fiction. Um, so it might be a little bit different with like uh, documentaries where there's a truth setting or seeking element to it. But um, I mean, does it matter? Should, should, should we have those? Uh, boundaries on those things I, I don't really know i'm, I'm really kind of just asking I, I don't know i can be if I, I won't call it the full steel man but i can be sympathetic to what what people who do want to invoke those boundaries um want and i think it's that that it's not that they actually assume everybody's monolithic I, mm -hmm. It's just that this style, this approach, these, this framework is a shortcut. It's, it helps you make the first, second, or third assumptions about how to get those alternative narratives into the space so that we can eventually have that discussion about what is true. And I think that they just use the identity as the shortcut, not because they believe it's monolithic, but because the ultimate goal is to help these other narratives rise up into the fullness of the discussion. And we can't really know if you're issuing a grant or you're watching a film at a film festival or you're streaming a film on Netflix, you can't really know if um, that particular filmmaker has the supposed dominant view of that subgroup, but you can say, okay, well, we gave this per we, we, we kind of understood it as a shortcut and we gave this, we made room for this person to try and get this alternative perspective up. Um, I vacillate between the cynicism of the control for power and the sincerity of viewpoint diversity leading to truth amongst the cohort that pushes for, you know, these strict guidelines on who can make a film. But I do I do think there is a sincerity aspect even to the, um, you know, identity epistemology of why people, why we're, why we're choosing this person in the first place. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It does. And, and let me sharpen what I said earlier. Um, I absolutely agree that we should have in film, what, scripted or unscripted, um, not only different points of view, but, you know, people from different backgrounds, people from different positions, whether they're by, by race, gender, uh, culture, uh, orientation, etc. The reason I believe that is because we don't have enough of that. And, it, and, and we want to have a diversity of uh, viewpoints and, and ideas. So I'm a big proponent for that. But... This is just my, um, it's not evaluation, but I guess it's just kind of like my yardstick, is what is always central for me is the story or the narrative. If that sucks, but it's made by a Latin woman, I mean, I don't really care at that point, right? Like, I want the story to be good. I want the narrative to be good. I want the message to be good. You know, I want the art or I want the, mm -hmm. the, the, the truth, you know, elements of there. Mm -hmm. Just because you can check a couple boxes on something. Well, it was a woman and she was Latin and she was an immigrant and whatever, but it just sucks. 
or I, or I personally don't like it, or it's just not very well done, or whatever, then why does then that doesn't really matter at that point? Then it's just like okay, well, it, this wasn't you know objectively or subjectively very good. Um, and there's been I like that plenty of you know white dudes that have made shit movies and shit documentaries. Um, of course, I mean that just happens, right? So I, I'm I I I think we should have that. And I, I want to have that and I want to have more of that, but I don't want it to be where it's mm, tokenized or um, that's the central piece of it. Um, and I think sometimes that does happen. And it's like, yeah, this was cool, but, you know, it just wasn't that great. It wasn't very good. It was, you know, and everyone's going to have different preferences, but, you know, I think, again, it goes back to my point I was making earlier. <clears throat> Excuse me. That let me say it another way. There are many people that want to tell good stories and good narratives, and they should have all the opportunities and all the chances they have, regardless of what they look like or you know who they love or you know whatever box they check on a form. And I think we should be there, right? I don't think this should be dominated well, by a, a group of people or a small subset of group of people. I think you hit it on the head when you said, "I think we should be there." Um, I actually think that, again, I'm just, just being as sympathetic as I can to the point of view that is trying to make room for alternative voices, which has have previously been left out of the conversation, that some of this stuff is a ham fisted sporadic approach to, you know, how to create that space. And that ultimately those people at the end of the day, you know, whether it's 20 years from now or 40 years from now, probably in, in their true heart, believe that one day we'll have the, we'll be in a place where everybody can just speak and they'll be like, but we're just not there yet. Right. We're not there yet. We're in the place where we need to intentionally create room for the voices, which have not been there. And then the shortcut about the identity is how they make, is how they process that room. Right. But I actually, I just, um, I just think some of us maybe question the continuing need for it, or we think there is a continuing need for it, but maybe we could articulate the end game a little bit better so that we don't get stuck in the version of the universe where we're doing this forever. Mm -hmm. I struggle with that. I think some people have given me feedback before saying, well, we just need to do this for right now. And I'm like, well, then clearly say that this is for right now, because it sounds like the whole lived experience argument is not one of a temporal nature. It is one of an essential nature. And if you, if you say it's essential, it is going to far outlive any temporary space that you think this whole architecture of who can tell what story is designed to, you know, to deliver on. Mm -hmm. So um, but I still, even though they don't articulate it, I suspect that it's there, that the idea isn't to limit who can say what forever. It's just to limit it who can speak now. I don't approve of either. I just don't think that you can predict who is, who is going to be good at telling you what is true. Um, and so I don't want to limit it, but I, I, th I think that's a pretty sympathetic way to view people on the other side. Yeah, I... There's, uh, let me give a few examples here. Um, and I'll just use gender for a minute, right? <clears throat> because I know that's a thing that, that gets talked about a lot in film and things like that. You know, I think, um, again, for me, I, I guess it just depends on the motivations for people. When I go and I see any film, I'm just looking for the story and the, the narrative and the messaging. I'm not looking to see how many... X amount of so-and-so is in it or isn't in it or whatever. I don't go and say how many Latin men are in this movie. And if there's not seven, then I'm not watching it. I just don't think that way. That's mm. not to say I don't want representation. I obviously do, but I don't want it in an arbitrary forced check a box kind of way, right? If it makes sense for the story and, and it's, it's wide ranging and it's inclusive in a very natural way. Yes. So, example, you know, uh, The Hurt Locker um, mm. was a great film. It was a great story. You know, and Catherine Bigelow won Best Director and because she, you know, fucking kicked ass. I mean, it was a great movie. She did a great job. Okay. Like, I don't, I don't need her to make films only about, like, women. 
right? That's fine. She does. Yeah. But take another example. Um, uh, oh God, what's the young woman's name? <sighs> she did Lady Bird and she did Little Women. Oh, um. Oh my God, I'm drawing a blank. Here, I'll look it up and you can edit this out. Okay. Her name is. It's Noah Baumbach's wife. Why can't I? And I never think of anyone that way. <laughs> Greta Gerwig. Yeah, Greta Gerwig. She made these movies, Lady Bird and Little Women, that were pretty obviously wanting to tell a uh, a story or stories about women from a female perspective. But it, it's well done. The stories were great. You know, one's based off a novel, so obviously there's you know, some of the, uh, you know, credit goes to the, the author, but her, there's been plenty of adaptations of that book and hers was, I thought, fantastic. Um, Lady Bird was a great film. I mean, that's fine. But uh, another example, you know, that doesn't mean that men can't write stories about women. I think a lot of my point in saying this stuff is that I understand, yes, there is a history of, you know, you know white male dominance in film and okay, that's true, and we shouldn't have it that way. We should have anybody able to make films and tell the stories they want to tell. If it's about women, or if it's about people of color, or if it's about people that have been disenfranchised, great, fine, make those stories, and we should we should watch them, and we should you know enjoy them, and learn from them, or or get something from them. But I just think it's the way in which it's done, where the story is the centerpiece, and that's first, and it's not this arbitrary you know, let's check all these boxes and, you know, say we have, you know, diversity or whatever it is. I, I just, I, I like the, how it can be organic and how it mm. can, and have the central part of a message and story um, to, to be able to say those things. And, and just like what your point was saying, you know, <laughs> women shouldn't just make stories or films about women. You know, they can make whatever they want and they should be able to make whatever they want. You know, and I and we need them important. to, we need them to comment on everything and we need people of color to comment on everything, whether it's their business or not their business, because yeah. those same perspectives that we want to bring to the, um, you know, lived experience of what it's like to be in that community. We want those eyes looking at all the other communities as well, yes. and looking at all the other contexts. We need, we need perspective, <laughs> even though they're outsiders to their community, we need their perspective. We need our perspective. I, um, I and I sometimes wonder if it's just a failure of imagination, if it's just a, mm -hmm. a moment in time we're arguing over, if it's just somebody got out ahead and managed to persuade everybody that this is the tool, this is the best tool to combat the historic legacy of oppression. Right. Um, but it does seem to be a trend. And um, I don't know where it's gonna go. I've seen a little shift already. I know that Sundance is coming out with another core application which is going to address some of these issues in a different way than they did a couple of years ago so i i guess the conversation is continuing but maybe there's room for people who see it really we need all the perspectives on all the subjects and anyways i was just saying i don't i don't know where it's going but it feels like it's shifting again and maybe that's good um i think it's worth talking about this stuff and i think it's definitely worth uh, both proponents of the lived experience view and people that may want the, you know, broader perspectives to just talk about it and critique each other. Again, going back to the critique, if I make a movie about someone who doesn't share my identity and you think it's crap, by all means, write about it, shout about it, mm -hmm. tell everybody why, hopefully use a little more than ad hominem attacks and just, mm -hmm. you know, provide evidence mm -hmm. for your view, but do it. Do it, man. I think that's the process, right? What? Well, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. And and um, the reason I bring this up is because apparently uh, people were upset and attacking Ken Burns. Mm. And in my book, you do not attack Ken Burns. He is a national treasure. He should have his own monument somewhere in this country. Do not attack Ken Burns. Um, so I, I'm assuming you're familiar with this story. Do you want to just kind yeah. of give us the, give us the cliff notes version for listeners? Yeah, sure. Um, Ken Burns is a, uh, is a filmmaker who has a long-term contract with PBS. I think it's renewed. I don't know if it's annual or biannual, but in other words, he keeps getting secure 
work hours dedicated on public television to programming. I don't know how they choose it. I don't know if he pitches them and they say yes, or if he just has carte blanche to decide what stories he's going to tell. But either way, um, you know, he tells a lot of stories about American history. Those intersect race in a a different way all the time. He's a white male. We've been listening to his white male perspective on American history for um, 20, you know, 30 years. And there were some filmmakers who wanted to ask uh, PBS to maybe make room for filmmakers who were not white males to have, um, you know, as much airtime as Ken Burns. Um, This group of people wrote a letter asking to hold PBS accountable, asking them for specific information about what, how many hours of programming went to filmmakers who were not Ken Burns, or were not white males, and to um, evaluate their, I guess, executive suite and the, you know, the people who work at PBS to see if those people also reflected the diversity of America. And this was actually some time ago. Well, it started a long time ago and then it kind of came up around again and then it came up around recently because now Ken Burns um, actually gave an interview where he responded to the criticism. And I think just to sum up his response, it was not an apology. It was a justification. And I I don't mean that negatively. It was just, he justified his um, position and said, well, I am a specialist in American history. There's no way that I can tell any story without it intersecting diverse cultures. And um, my job is to make sure my team is reflective of that. I hire people of color, I hire academics of color, we place people of color in the film. um, And we hope that it's a perspective that we've all mediated and can come to agree upon. And the, the controversy was that he was unfit to, actually, I don't even know if the controversy is that he was unfit to tell certain stories or as much as he just took up a lot of airtime on public television and people want their um, day at the races. I think there was, I think it was, my, my reading of it was there's was two issues at play, two, two separate but uh, interconnected issues. The first one was the one that you mentioned about why are we, how much, you know, uh, power or time or whatever with PBS that Ken Burns has where he just gets a blank check of time and money and resources to do whatever he wants. And he's been doing this for, I think, almost 50 years. The guy's almost. Oh, yeah. yeah. I probably found out about him 25 years ago. (laughs) Yeah, he's he's forever. Right. Um, But so I think that was the thing is like, okay, why aren't other, you know, people, uh, why isn't PBS giving more, you know, just as much or or other airtime to um, other uh, people that are doing documentaries um, that are people of color or certain minority groups, et cetera. So that's the first issue, which you which you said, and then I think the second issue was, how can he be able as a white man to tell stories about other races in American history, such as uh, I think he did one on the history of jazz, which has a very um, uh, heavily history in um, the African American uh, community, and I think he was actually doing or is doing. Uh, uh, a project, I don't know if it's a film or a series on, uh, or like a sort of mini series or something on um, Muhammad Ali. Mm-hmm. And of course, Muhammad Ali is uh, a black man and he also was, I believe, part of Nation of Islam or he had, he had some uh, uh, um, interest in some of the aspects of uh, the black community, etc. And they were like, um... We don't know if we want Ken Burns, a white dude, telling the story about Muhammad Ali. That should maybe just be done by a black person. And um, so these are the two issues. And this was kind of, I was thinking about this when I brought it up earlier. And it's like, is it okay for people outside of a race or, you know, we can broaden this out of a gender to say, yeah, you can't tell that story. You know, or is it, of course you can tell that story, but you know, let's make sure we get all perspectives, right? We want to have the, the black man or woman that's doing a documentary on Muhammad Ali to also be able to get, you know, uh, their time in the sun and that theirs can get airplay and that they can get picked up by whatever, whatever. Um, but that also happens. How do you, you know, kind of using that example, I mean, what do you, what do you think about people that do that or should they do that or is it just really subjective is is this kind of overblown 
Um, I mean, underlying this, all, underlying this all is a fight for resources that exists for documentary filmmakers in which mm -hmm. they feel like maybe opportunities aren't abundant for them to have their voice heard. And I, I, I think Ken Burns is the most obvious example. First of all, how many average viewers know even the names of documentary filmmakers? There's probably like three. They know Werner Herzog, they know, you know, Ken Burns, they know Errol Morris, they don't really know any other filmmakers. And so I just think that that belies really how documentary filmmakers feel in the ecosystem of making their art. They're beleaguered, they fight for resources all the time, and then a few of them hoard resources at the top. and it's frustrating. And I think one of the ways which you can address that is to say, well, does the filmmaker at the top represent the necessary voices that we need for this moment in time? Um, I, I don't think you can, I mean, they will position it as, you know, Ken Burns is unfit to tell Muhammad Ali's story. I don't even know if they think he's unfit or if they just want the opportunity for, you know, a black director to helm that story because it's significant in a number of ways. It's significant in that it literally spreads the financial resources. It's putting money in someone's pocket. It's elevating their profile. It's giving them a shot to develop their careers on top of the fact that they might have another perspective that if that Ken Burns wouldn't bring to the table. So I think so many of those dynamics underlie um, this particular example. And I, I think it's unfortunate. I don't, I'm not a big Ken Burns fan. I've, I've definitely seen like three or four of his series and I respect what he does. Um, I, I, I also think it's that he's the architect of history. And this goes back to the narrative, resting control of the narrative. I think we have, we have a history war at hand right now, right? Like in the larger context, 1776 versus 1619, we have a war for the interpretation of history going on. And this just slides right in there as the man who preeminently, you know, makes films about American history, whether it's jazz or baseball or the Vietnam war is of the dominant class. And a lot of people are just ready to say, you know, use your resources for something else. I don't agree with that. I don't, even if I'm not a big Ken Burns style film fan, I, I think he's probably a mature filmmaker. I think he's a critic. He thinks critically, he really intentionally tries to step out of his version of reality. Um, but I get it. I get it. I just it wouldn't be my choice. Well, I don't know if I'll forgive you for not being a big Ken Burns fan. I don't know if I can forgive <laughs> I don't know. you. I hope I never meet Ken. <laughs> I don't know if I can forgive you on that, but um, <laughs> um, I, he I hear that. I hear those arguments. I guess it just for me is like, I don't know. It's just frustrating to hear in some ways because it's like, yes, I agree. We should have more black directors or, you know, women directors or, you know, other, um, um, ethnicities and, and things like that. But I mean, he's almost 70. I mean, he's, yeah. he's, he's done his time. He, he, he did all the hard work. He did all the stuff in the seventies and the eighties and the nineties. And like, he worked extremely hard. I mean, it takes him like 10 years or something. Sometimes longer, I think to like do the research, do the filming, do the post, et cetera. I mean, and that's not to say that other people aren't doing hard work as well. Absolutely, obviously, everyone is doing hard work. But he has really meticulously done it. I mean, the Vietnam War, uh, the one that he did, which came out uh, 2000, yeah, whatever. It's 14, like three years ago, I think. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it wasn't that long ago. I mean, it was, I mean, I've read plenty of books on that era and things like that. And it was just so... I mean, the depth of it, but the fact that from the beginning, not only was he talking about the war itself and the Americans um, involvement in the war, I mean, he was interviewing North Vietnamese and South Vietnamese soldiers on film. He was telling what was going on culturally in the 60s. Um, with civil rights, you know, mm -hmm. talking to many people of color like there's just he, it was. 
you could see like, sure, maybe there's like one or two things or, you know, here or there or whatever that he just, you know, didn't quite get or something. But you can see in the, uh, what is it, nine or 11 episodes, I think they're two hours each. So whatever that is, you know, that you know, 20 hours or however, 24 hours, however many hours it is on that documentary, he tried his damnedest to be as comprehensive and as balanced with all perspectives as he possibly could. Yeah, and I, I think there's something weird about the conceit that um, one particular group of people is just not able to see outside of themselves. And I, I, I mean that in a way in which I don't, I, I still acknowledge the bias, but that somehow a person, like this goes back to the craft and the pursuit and the external validation and all the things that we talked about. There's something weird to think that, you know, even though we're all biased that people can't hone that craft of seeing outside of themselves, mm -hmm. that it's not a practice that you experience over and over of like being mm -hmm. like, Oh, I know, I, I know what my biases are. So I'm going to put controls in place to address them or challenge them as part of my practice. And I think, you know, without really knowing his process, I just given the work product that he has, I suspect he is one of those people that has spent a long time asking themselves, how do I get outside of my biases? Because I, I am trying to talk about history and there wow. is no way that one individual can lean into their subjective experience and purport to have any historical, like be real, be real about history in any way. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a little bit strange that of all the people in, in the hot seat at the end of the day, it's Ken Burns, but at the same time, it's so predictable, right? It's so yeah. predictable because he yeah. is the most visible filmmaker, you know, when he works in public television, which has a mandate at least to represent Americans. So maybe it's a little bit easier to target PBS than say Netflix, if Netflix makes a deal like that. But mm -hmm. I don't know, it's interesting. I definitely, I would like to learn from him for sure. I think it, he has a lot to share in his filmmaking process that I think we all could use a, a little bit of his, of his, um, he's a living practice. legend. Yeah. Yeah. He's, 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 he's a genius. In my, in my okay. Mind. Maybe I I'll take back my saying I'm not no. the biggest Ken Burns fan. I'll okay. take it back. All right. All right. Yeah. Um, okay. What, one question here. Um, are there things that shouldn't be documented Are there things we shouldn't, we shouldn't, uh, not necessarily discuss, but you know, in terms of, I'm thinking of films and documentary films. Are there just things that we shouldn't uh, shouldn't document? Um, I don't know if there's a hard line of something that you shouldn't document. I I think that again, these are about tensions and values and and how those tensions push into each other. I think that you know, you gain the trust of your subjects in most cases. And if they express to you that certain things are not what they want shown, I think you have a responsibility to either one, try and persuade them to say like, oh, actually, I think this vulnerability will be valuable for the following reason, if you can see yourself to sharing it, or to respect that that's part of the consent process for them, for you making a film about them. But of course, not all, some films are meant to harm people. They're investigative journalism documentaries that go after big corporations and whatnot and may invade people's privacy intentionally. So I wouldn't apply what I said to every circumstance. I think you have to look at the, um, you have to look at the, you know, what it is that you're doing and every circumstance will have its own kind of ethical boundaries. Um, I think journalists have struggled with this and I'd be really interested to see if they have an ethics, uh, an ethics guideline on this in some way. But I mean, very famously, I think the, is it the um, photographer who, who shot a napalm girl, I think committed suicide because he felt, I don't oh, know. It was the, it was the vulture eating her because she was so, um, malnourished or something like that. Oh, Is this right? And he just shot the picture. It's very I iconic. Think it's nap I, maybe it's that guy. Maybe it's the vulture right. guy and not napalm mm -hmm. girl from the Vietnam war. But, mm -hmm. um, I and, think and she ended up dying and he just, he just documented it. He didn't want to involve, get involved in the, 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 I don't say scene, the, uh, the event or what was, what he was documenting. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the person died and then I think he, yeah, he killed himself. Right. 
Yeah. So again, I think this is goes to the tension. Uh, do I think it was wrong to document her circumstances? No, but if documentation took a uh, priority over aid altogether, if you can do both, I don't know why I, 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 I guess I understand the intellectual argument behind not, um, you know, not inter interfering in an event as a journalist, but I do, again, I just, these come back to tensions and values. And I think you have to know what the point is and you have to ask yourself, is there a superior value that says I should not document this for a very good reason? Then yes. And if not, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule about what you shouldn't film. I don't think it's like somehow that the situation will tell you, um, it shouldn't be seen by audiences, right? That would be like the opposite of that. Yeah, I, I would just say, to, I, I agree. I think I would just say it in a different way. I would say, I don't know if there's things that we shouldn't document. I just think it really, 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 really becomes important of how you do it. Mm -hmm. um, is kind of my loose and fresh thoughts yeah. about it. I like that. But, but I would it, say the it's same. It's more of the, especially with visuals, it's all about presentation. Okay, so the <laughs> the last thing I want to ask you is uh, something I usually ask people in the beginning. Um, I realized I, I didn't ask you at any point um, what it is that you do currently <laughs> to talk about the films you make currently um, or have, I guess, or have, you know, you have a kind of niche of certain types of uh, documentary films you, you guys do. And... I guess, you know, why you wanted to do that and how you got into that, but, you know, and, and will you keep doing that? And then also where you're headed, and you've already talked about that, but just kind of a little bit more broadly where you're headed and, you know, just kind of, um, you know, kind of what you're overall from the stuff that you've made and how you think about what you've made thus far, what you're currently working on and what you want to work on. So kind of like a past, present, future thing. Um, you know, what's your ultimate aim? Yeah, so I came from outdoor and environment and I came from there because um, when I joined my husband at filmmaking, he was an environmental biologist and rock climber and mountaineer who was a filmmaker in that vein because those were his passions. Mm -hmm. I cut my teeth and learned how to make films in that sphere. I enjoyed it. I found parts of myself that I didn't know existed in my own enjoyment of the outdoors and my own, um, you know, application to action sports. Um, and then I learned to be an environmentalist, which was very important and a central aspect of me now. So certainly through the process of applying my brain to somebody else's passion, I found passions of my own. Sure. Yeah. And and then I don't know. I think this film appeared to be a perfect hybrid. This uh, the Conservatives for Climate Change film because it was environmental at its heart, um, but it had a little bit more of my vision for looking at the world in it, or it has a little bit more. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm really interested in um, people who deviate from their group. I'm interested in stories that subvert. Uh, the mainstream. And I think documentarians will often say that without noticing that they've become part of the mainstream, but what used to subvert becomes mainstream. And then you have to change again to resubvert. Yeah. And, um, and I think there's a number of films out there right now that probably do that, that are, I don't know if they're untouchable, but certainly if you Tr go after them, you might be thought to be pushing the boundaries of what's acceptable. Mm -hmm. And they're all, um, and I think that's really interesting because I actually don't think they're, I don't actually don't think that they're off limits. I just think that documentary filmmakers don't really want to make these films because they don't fit the mainstream ideology that documentary filmmakers have. I, I'm, I'm fond of saying that documentary film as a industry is so far left that if you are center left, you're practically a fascist. Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting. That means there's like a whole market of films around centrism, depolarization, center right, center left kind of things that are going on in society that aren't even really um address that much in filmmaking i don't know if i'll go there i know that um this current film is a long journey i mean they're all long but like it takes like two years to make a film a feature film so in that time i might have changed my mind enough times to decide my next film is something 
that isn't about deviating from a group that I got the great satisfaction that I wanted out of exploring this topic Mm -hmm. um, or not. But I know that there's lots of interesting stories out in the world to apply. I'm interested in nuclear energy. I'm interested in why, why people are so, I mean, I, I mean, I get fundamentally why people are so scared of nuclear energy, but like given its propensity to solve problems and given its advanced stage from what most people think of and given the, fundamental ability now to reuse nuclear waste like how like where are the films on this where I guess interesting to me that there's just like not much out there on it so I think that there's storytelling that really does maybe fill a gap in, that I have in my mind um and I think that's a good place to be because uh if there is a gap you're like why why is this there this gap right now and I think exploring that is really interesting yeah, I mean, sorry. Well, the nuclear energy thing is interesting. There's a there's a long history with that, so, mm-hmm. and it keeps keeps moving and ebbing and flowing, and it's it's very fascinating. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting what you're saying about like how maybe people that make documentaries they will you know try to kind of be you know think outside the box, and then whatever they're doing then becomes normative, and then they have to read you know. You know, mm-hmm. They got to change it, and you know they got to keep it fresh. They got to find you know things, and and there's always things out there, but it's just pushing pushing things. Um, and it's interesting the shift from it. It seems like there's a there's a at least for you in terms of doing some more polarization or political kinds of sphere of things that there's a there's a new shift for you. As a you know, it, it's very interesting to kind of see your story or your own narrative of you know, kind of how you were raised and then how you were trained and then how you second career. And then it was these types of films. And now it's a new shift. It's a, a shift into something else, which is, it's always interesting. I think it says something about, you know, how the person uh, is becoming and growing and evolving. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a really cool thing to, to see. And I think that's sort of kind of the fail safe from getting locked down into like an echo chamber or, mm-hmm getting locked into an ideology and getting very like um, parochial and things. Cause people, that will happen. They'll get real impassioned about something and then they become zealots <laughs> and then they become activists. Then they become, you know um, you know, these types of, of folks. And, um, and I guess that has its place, but I, I think it can be very many times it can be pretty, pretty dangerous and, and just not very helpful sometimes, not always, but sometimes. Yeah. I love that word zealot. I actually really love it. And I would actually say that describes documentary filmmakers in so many ways, not all of them, but like a good chunk of them for sure. And I would say for what, where I am right now, I think, I think sometimes it's frustrating for peers of mine to see me go from, you know, completely understanding and being in lockstep with the sort of, um, you know, social justice framework of the world to maybe questioning more of it. And I would say it largely happened because I already left one religion and I know how hard it was to do that. And I know how hard it was to um, accept new information and new data that didn't comport with your worldview and to, um, you know, face, have that reckoning. And I, um, I sensed again that if I wasn't careful, I would end up in the same place. And I have an aversion to that. Mm-hmm. I, um, while, while everyone has a worldview, there seems to be a fundamental difference between ideologues and um, I just, those who are willing to update their worldview when new information is at hand. And I, I, f- I spent so long practicing the part of me that was willing to update and, and like, you know, basically say, I don't know everything. And I don't know is a comfortable place to be. I had to learn to say, I don't know, to leave my religion. Um, I just prefer to stay in that place. And I think that that's been the evolutionary journey of me as a filmmaker, as well as to stay in the, I don't know, um, appreciate people who deviate from the norm because chances are they're doing it because they see something interesting in the world. And, um, and then just share with, you know, audiences that there are other stories out there that may subvert the mainstream and that if you do a good job, I could, I could show you something interesting. Yeah. Well, I appreciate how much of a zealot you are and I appreciate your passion and your you know sharp analytical mind. Um, 
So this was a lot of fun. Where can people find your work already and, and you know, uh, online or wherever? Where, where are the best places to find you and, and your work that, uh, that you've done? Yeah, you can look at my website. It's www.encompassfilms.com. And I can be found on Twitter at Egyptian. That is ironic that I have a Twitter handle that is based off of my uh, ethnic identity, but <laughs> let's just call it 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, that is E G I P X Y A N. Mm -hmm. No. E G Y P X I A E G Y P X I A N. <laughs> I'll Hazard. Put in the notes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, anything else that you'd like to say? Uh, no, thoughts? I just really, I really enjoyed this. It was really fun. Um, I hope that people just, you know, take whatever I have to say with a grain of salt. I'm just one more voice in the chorus, speaking, thinking out loud, chewing the fat with you, Javier. And hopefully somebody enjoys it because it feeds, it's a, it's a same mental stimulation that we get out of having this chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I, I absolutely enjoyed it. And um, it, was, it was quite interesting to, to go to the places that we went. I wasn't necessarily expecting that. And that's, uh, that's always uh, fun for me. So I'm glad that we were able to, to have the conversation. Thanks for coming on and, and doing it. Yeah, hope to speak again. All right.